This video is sponsored by Audible. Click the link in the description to start your free trial and get your free book. I didn't see the explosion itself. Just the flames. Everything was radiant. The whole sky. A tall flame. And smoke. The heat was awful. And he still is not back. This is an excerpt from the first page of Nobel laureate Svetlana Alexievich's book, Voices from Chernobyl, published in 1997. Across a 10-year span, Svetlana interviewed over 500 eyewitnesses of the horrific Chernobyl accident. The book dives into the psychological and personal tragedy of what happened at Chernobyl and explores the experiences of how the event impacted the lives of those affected. It is an extremely important book because it brings light to a subject that was actively suppressed when concerning Chernobyl. The truth. For years, the Russian government tried to hide what really happened, to cover up the reality of the horrible events that transpired. And by way of what some might consider to be cruel irony, the Russian government's wish of having the events of Chernobyl shrouded in darkness did come to pass. However, it wasn't because of anything the Russian government did themselves. What swept the truth of Chernobyl under the rug was time. As the years passed, bringing with them the deaths of eyewitness survivors, either from illness or old age, the attention and reverence that the Chernobyl disaster garnered faded throughout the world. No longer were people thinking of the families in Pripyat, or the firemen that rushed to the reactor site, or the miners that worked the irradiated ground, all those people that Svetlana Alexievich researched for her book. No. Instead of an emotional connectivity to the unfathomable human suffering and death caused by the reactor explosion, or the brave men and women who battled to uncover the truth of the matter, Chernobyl became synonymous with abandoned buildings and empty playgrounds, stagnant, silent fixtures that held no truths or stories of their own. Eventually, Chernobyl became nothing more than a tagline for blockbuster movies and video games, used as a cheap tool to whet the appetites of people that knew Chernobyl was quote-unquote bad but we're unsure as to why. The facility's name is Chernobyl. The stories that Svetlana Alexievich worked to uncover for a decade, the harrowing truths she learned from the mouths of survivors, became secondary info when Chernobyl became mentioned, overridden by the general knowledge of hollow factoids such as radiation levels and years of uninhabitability. Chernobyl reached the status of legend, but it was a legend that very few people connected to or knew truthfully. And this is a large part of the two reasons I felt Craig Mazin was so successful in his writing of HBO's Chernobyl. Aside from great performances by Stellan Skarsgård, Jared Harris, and many others, not to mention the fantastic set pieces and soundtrack, Craig Mazin excelled in writing and engaging fiction because of how he interacted with the knowledge that the audience did and did not bring to the table. Craig Mazin, in my estimation, understood perfectly just where our knowledge of Chernobyl ended and our ignorance on the matter began. In this video, I want to go over his decisions and the process by which he arrived at them so that other writers who appreciate his work, like myself, might be able to create similarly captivating narratives. Let's take a look at the first reason I believe Chernobyl succeeded. Through the first episode's one hour runtime, there is a palpable dread looming over every action and event. These people that we are watching believe that they're fine, only concerned about what they think is a far off fire. Even the government officials, who at least know more than the citizens, don't know the full truth of the matter. But of course, we as the audience know better. Even with our general passing knowledge, we know that Chernobyl was an absolutely horrific tragedy that depopulated an entire region. Yet we have to watch these people believe they are okay. The flaming reactor is like a monster looming ever present in the distance, killing people without them even knowing. The show purposely lets us stew in the misfortune of these individuals to deliver a sense of anguish and horror and also to grab our attention. Jared Harris, who played Legasov, certainly felt these emotions evoked. In an interview with Deadline, he has said, The first episode is almost a horror movie. At times, it's like a deconstructed Godzilla story. That was all very deliberate by Craig. But for most people watching, episode one is where their knowledge of the Chernobyl disaster ends. Are you stupid? Which in turn is the reason why Craig Mazin changes how the show interacts with the audience going forward. Instead of presenting us with more circumstances where we know the truth ahead of the characters, the show punches us in the gut each episode by educating us on details so biblical in their scope that it makes us feel like we should have known them all along. In episode 2, we are told that it's not just Chernobyl in its surrounding area that is in danger, but all of the land that comprises modern day Ukraine. But then we learn in the next episode that even those fears are inadequate, 
as all of Russia is in danger. And then again, the stakes are raised when we find out that the entire continent itself is in peril. In a fictional setting, conflict escalation like this would be brushed off as unbelievable poor writing that stretches the bounds of suspension of disbelief. But that is specifically why Chernobyl is so stunning. It feels like a fiction, but blows us away with the certainty of its reality. The show plays with our ignorance regarding the actual events of Chernobyl to keep us captivated in a story that we shouldn't believe, but have to. We are stuck on our couches thinking, the world almost ended, and I didn't know. A storyline like this would be more well suited for a fantasy, where a group of heroic knights stopped a dark lord with some insane power level from wiping out mankind a millennium ago. Except here, our heroes are Soviet scientists, the dark lord is Russia, the power level is Runkin, and a millennium ago is 1986. And this fantasy feeling of the show came complete with its own challenge of lore and exposition. How does the nuclear reactor work? What? It's a simple question. In a narrative that deals with some of the most complex physics in the world, it made sure to impart the proper knowledge onto the audience so we knew what was happening. We learned of decimeter readings, megawatt outputs, and control rod compositions, all in service to grasping the full weight of how dire the situation really was. And introducing this information wasn't easy, as exposition rarely ever is. In fact, Craig Mazin said the most difficult thing of all for him to write was the final episode's trial scene, where Legasov explains the inner workings of the RBMK reactor. It's nearly an entire episode of detailing nuclear physics, yet it not only feels important to the audience, but engaging as well. This may be because it follows a principle laid out in Robert McKee's book, Story. In it is written, if at a certain point in the telling, a piece of exposition must be known or the audience wouldn't be able to follow, create the desire to know by arousing curiosity. Chernobyl spent four episodes leading up to why this reactor exploded, which created a hunger in the audience to know the truth, no matter how scientific or boring it might be outside the fiction. But again, everything that has been detailed is a testament to Craig Madden's ability to properly gauge the level of knowledge that the audience has and adapt his narrative accordingly. Writing suspenseful drama is a mind game with the audience. You give too little information and the suspense dies under its own weight of feeling unknowable. You give too much and the suspense evaporates because the audience arrives to the answers too quickly. Whether it be monumental events like Europe going extinct, or tiny details like the metal of a control rod, the writing of Chernobyl presents us the information that we need while simultaneously preying upon the knowledge that we don't have. But even this is only one part of what makes the show's writing so great. The other factor, and in my opinion, the most important factor, is that Chernobyl as a show isn't about the explosion of the RBMK reactor or the nuclear consequences that the world might face. Chernobyl as a narrative is about people. At the end of the day, it is the individuals and their experiences within the story that kept our eyes glued to the screen. Listen to writer Craig Mazin talk about it himself. It's not about the explosion. I want to show you what it's really about. And I want to tell the story through the lens of people. What I want them to take away more than anything is that if you lie, if you are part of a system of lying, if you are someone who agrees with lies that are given to you by your government, by your leaders, by your churches, by your friends, by Facebook, there is a cost attached to this. Not many people can relate to having radiation burns. Everyone can relate to being lied to and being hurt by such lies. That is why Chernobyl was so captivating. It anchored these unbelievable, nigh impossible stakes with the stories of people. And of course, Chernobyl is by no means the first fiction to tackle larger-than-life events from a human perspective. Transformers brought the conflict of the Cybertronians down to a human level by focusing on Sam Witwicky. Godzilla in 2014 used Aaron Taylor Johnson and Brian Cranston to ground the narrative in a human perspective. Now, whether or not those films were successful in their attempts is another debate entirely, but I think what sets Chernobyl apart is the luxury it has in being able to deal with deeply real human issues. Instead of watching a 30-foot tall robot shoot missiles at Shia LaBeouf, Chernobyl makes me watch a teenager muster up the grit to shoot dogs. Instead of watching a character hide from rampaging kaijus, Chernobyl shows me a pregnant woman dealing with the loss of her family. From the very beginning, Chernobyl was not trying to hide what it was. The fate of the reactor is part of the opening scene, only preceded by the fate of our main character, who kills himself within minutes of appearing. We aren't meant to be invested in if the reactor explodes, or if Legasov dies. We are meant to be invested in the struggles of the people within, and the truth as to why these things happened, and why that truth is being concealed. 
The revelation of truth is the climax of the last episode, and everything before it was meant to frame how difficult arriving to such a truth-telling would be for everyone involved. Chernobyl, as a narrative, approaches the nuclear incident in the same way that Svetlana Alexievich did in her book. It strayed away from centering itself on how much radiation was left in the air, or how many buildings were left empty, and focused on the human experiences. Svetlana's approach shines through so greatly in Chernobyl because Craig Mazin used it to guide himself. I had the benefit of an incredible book by, uh, written by a woman named Svetlana Alexievich, who is a, a Nobel Prize winning author called Voices from Chernobyl, and it is a collection of first-person accounts. And I thought that was uh, remarkable, and in many ways just as important, if not more so, than the various governmental reports and books and news articles that laid out the events of Chernobyl and the causes and the science. Chernobyl took HBO subscribers by storm, who quite frankly weren't expecting much from the streaming service after Game of Thrones ended. But Craig Mazin and the rest of the creative team managed to deliver a narrative that has the merit to withstand the test of time even better than the actual Chernobyl accident did. People are quick to forget statistics and half-life numbers and abstract dangers without faces. People seldom ever lose remembrance of those that they have connected to and have watched fight and suffer, all to deliver a message. And Chernobyl's message is one that is truly timeless. To be a scientist is to be naive. We are so focused on our search for truth, we fail to consider how few actually want us to find it. But it is always there, whether we see it or not, whether we choose to or not. The truth doesn't care about our needs or wants. It doesn't care about our governments, our ideologies, our religions. It will lie in wait for all time. And this, at last, is the gift of Chernobyl. Where I once would fear the cost of truth, now I only ask, what is the cost of lies? Thank you all so much for watching. As I said at the beginning of the video, the channel has recently partnered with Audible. If you've been eyeing a particular book or wanted to try out Audible, today is your lucky day. Click the link in the description to receive a free book when you start a free Audible trial. And don't worry, there are no strings attached. You can cancel your free trial at any time with no money down. The more people that click the link to support Audible, the more support that this channel receives, meaning I can keep bringing you guys content. As always, it was a pleasure, and I will talk to you all again soon.